need to be dismissed are. As we're in the book of Proverbs, and we're in chapter 11, and we'll be picking up where we left off in verse 19. I just want to say thank you. I know while I was out with COVID, and uh, just I really appreciated men filling in for me, and I just, you know, they've always just stepped up, whether it was uh, short notice or whatever it may have been, and, and just taking care of things, and I greatly appreciate that. But again, uh, here in uh, chapter 11, picking up with verse 19, and again, all through the book of Proverbs, we're looking at wisdom, and uh, here, they're, we're contrasting uh, what the righteous do uh, against what, again, the wicked do, and he just walks down through uh, the, these contrasts, and of course, that instructs us as how we're to live, and how we're not to live. And so when we walk through the book of Proverbs, and especially in these instructive areas of Proverbs, uh, we're not just to read it and, and just, oh, hey, you know, that, that, that's really not nice. I like Proverbs. Now we're, we're to do what? Apply. Yeah, we read it, we come to an understanding of it, and then we apply it. And so we'll be picking up with that in mind as we continue in here in chapter 11, uh, verse 19. And uh, it says, as righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time that we have. Bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, again, very, very practical book. Uh, Proverbs isn't, honestly, any deep theology. It isn't any of those things. It's just practical, day-to-day -day living. And it gives us a, a glimpse, if you will. It gives us a peek at all the different 
aspects of life. You know how you'll tell somebody you can't do that. And the question comes back, what? Yeah, well, what about this? Well, no, you can't do that. Yeah, well, what if I do it this way? Yeah, but no, no, you can't. Okay, you know, you know, if I was over here, no, no, it's no, and it stays no. Listen, but man will question and question. He will come at it from every possible angle. Proverbs covers almost every possible angle. He just keeps coming back. This is righteous, and this is evil. Be involved in righteousness, because the evil ones, they're going to pay the price. Right. And, and, and so that's what, that's what God wants us to understand at every level. Listen, God has given us an understanding as to how to live, how to live in this sin-sick world. And so that's what this is about. And so again, as righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. And so the idea here is righteousness tendeth to life. It brings us, if you will, it takes us to life. Good life, now I have absolute confidence in this life in Jesus Christ. Also, life eternal. We have this relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and I have life eternal. And so as righteousness tendeth to life, both my daily living and my eternal life, uh, so he that pursueth evil, just like the guy who, who is righteous, the man who pursues evil, it is his, it's unto what his own death. There are consequences for what we do. There are consequences for the decisions we make. And that's the idea here. Listen, if you're pursuing righteousness, there's consequences and they're positive. You pursue evil, there are consequences. And there, there are evil consequences and both of, of those are eternal. And so walking down, verse 20, they that are of a froward heart. And again, we've looked at this word froward before, and it means willful, uh, uh, contrary, twisted, perverted. Um, these people who are froward heart in their heart are an abomination to the Lord. And again, that word abomination, we've looked at that a number of different times. But again, it's disgusting, it's hateful, it, it's detestable, it's loathsome before God. God rejects this. And so they that are froward, uh, again, froward heart, are abomination to the Lord. But such as are upright in their way, there is delight. Boy, to not be twisted in your thinking. These, these who are froward, they're twisted in their thinking. And, and they look at those things, and they could. Every single day, listen, when somebody gets out of bed, they can decide to do right, to head down the right, right direction, or do wrong. They, they, they have a choice to make every single day. But people, again, when they continually, ongoingly are involved in sin and in wickedness, pretty soon they get up in the morning and there's only one thing on their mind. Their mind is twisted. Their, their mind is it's froward. It is set in such a manner that unless a miraculous thing happens, salvation. You know, you can say, you know, they just can't help it. They've gotten to a point. Well, there is that point, quite honestly. But I think that takes a lot of getting to. But the reality is they can fall under and do. The Holy Spirit's doing his job. And he sent into the world to do what? Convict men. And he, listen, he's doing his job. So even the wicked, they're under conviction. But again, they get so calloused, as we've talked about before, that pretty soon that convicting power of the Holy Spirit, they don't even feel it. It's just like that calloused hand we've talked about a number of different times. You don't feel it at first. Uh, you, you're, you're working hard, whatever it may be. And you got blisters. You keep working like that every day, and those blisters turn into calluses. 
And the more you do it, the thicker they get. And pretty soon, well, you don't feel that. You know, it doesn't get irritated. It doesn't get red. You don't get blisters anymore. Uh, and, and you just don't feel it. Um, listen, that's the heart of this froward man, this froward person. Uh, they, they get to the place that they don't feel it. Unless, again, the word of God, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, finally gets a hold of their hearts and their minds. And they begin to think. They begin to think, hmm, maybe I shouldn't do that. And then the Holy Spirit has something to work with. But again, what they have to hear the word of God. Whether they hear it, read it, doesn't matter if they get on the radio, TV, from a personal witness, sit down and start reading the word of God. doesn't matter where they get it, but they need the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can take that and convict them of their need of a Savior in Jesus Christ. And so they are of a forward heart, are an abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way, ah, they're his delight. Isn't that great? Those of us, those believers around the world, uh, when they get up every morning, and what? They're not thinking evil. They're not thinking wickedness. They're not considering what can I go out and steal? What can I go out and do? What, what problems can I go cause today? Uh, no, these people are getting up. And what, you know, after, especially after people have been saved a while, and they're literally getting up and they're thinking about doing that which is right. They're, they're not going to cheat their neighbor, even if the opportunity arises. They just wouldn't do it. And, you know, after a while of, of being that way and, and just being under the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, pretty soon that never crosses their mind. They just don't do it. Just, just do not do it. Listen. As it tells us here, uh, it says that they are his, what? Delight. Listen, those who simply are obedient, their hearts are turned to the Lord. Their ways, they're seeking the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit of God. They are God's delight. I want to, you know, look, you want to be the devil's delight? Or do you want to be God's delight? And, and, and again, they both have consequences. You know, those who have followed the devil, I've read a number of different articles over the year of, of people who made a deal with the devil. Listen, if, if you will allow me this, and Mick Jagger, uh, Rolling Stone, Mick Jagger said, and go way back into the 1960s, uh, he said, he said I, I made a deal with the devil. I wanted to be the most popular rock star in the world. And he said, I made a deal. I'm his. He claimed to be, in the, about the mid-1960s, he claimed to be the devil incarnate at one point in time. And listen, he and at least a couple of his bandmates are still alive. You know, I don't know, he's up in the 70s somewhere. They're still doing rock concerts. He's still, I mean, when, when he has a concert, tens of thousands of people come. They, they can't do it in a large enough arena they, they pack it out all the time and here's this old skinny guy up there jumping around and screaming in a mic but he made it i made a deal with the devil i don't know that he would still admit that now but even the things that they did and i'll just i'll go ahead and i'll use him as an example years ago um i i saw they i don't know where i was what i was looking at but anyway some rolling stones come up with a new album called bridges to babylon I've never forgot it. Like bridges to Babylon. I mean, you know, these guys don't know what they're talking about. I mean, they use things like that and they don't understand what they're saying. So I looked it up. I looked up some of the words. You know exactly what he's saying. He was talking about the Apostle Paul and in literally referring to things in Apostle Paul in the Word of God, in his music. And, and again, it bridges to Babylon. Well, what, what's that? Babylon's a picture of hmm? picture of, of the world led by the devil himself. And, and so, again, even after all those years, he was still chasing after the devil himself. Listen, 
the idea is you can get up and every day and you make choices. After a while, you either become so callous from sin, you're getting up making evil choices every single day and, and you don't even know it doesn't bother you. Where the believer gets up and he's making righteous choices every day. And he gets to the place where that's what he does. He gets up, he does right. Why? Why would I want to do evil? Why would I want to do something against my neighbor? Why would I want to be a thief? Why would I want to do it? That's just not right. It ceases to become part of our thinking as we get closer and closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Verse 21, though hand joined in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. And this is interesting here because in verse 21 it says, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. What this is saying is it doesn't matter how many people you get to agree with you that what you're doing is right. If it's unrighteous, you're going to pay the price. And, and I think a number of different things, but again, I think the thing that sticks out more clearly than anything else in this nation is abortion. It doesn't matter how many hands are in hands, how many people agree that, no, this is right. This is what we must do. This is what we must continue doing. We must fight so that we can continue to murder babies. We can't let this stop. We it doesn't matter how many hands are in hands agreeing. It's mad. the idea of shaking hands on. You bet. I'm with you. I agree. It doesn't matter how many hands, how many hands join in hand. The wicked shall not be what unpunished. They will come. They will come. And they will pay the price. But the seed of the righteous shall be what delivered. Those who are righteous living rightly. Doing that which is right is being righteous. And so here, uh, the righteous shall be delivered. It says here, but the seed of the righteous, kind of an interesting verse, because it can either mean all the things that the righteous have planted, you know, and, and for God, you know, the, the lives that they have touched, the good things that they have done, the help that they have done, all of those kind of things. Uh, and on the other hand, the word seed can also mean what? Your children, your prodigy. And, and so can, you know, that, that word seed uh, can be used in a, in a couple of different ways. But the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Listen, the wicked will not overcome. Ultimately, in the end, the wicked doesn't do not overcome the righteous. Right. It is the righteous, ultimately, who overcome the wicked. and But they don't even know it. They don't even know it. And, and again, I think in the political climate that we're living in right now in this nation, the interesting thing is there are there are people um, who within the the liberal, you want to put a place that that group of liberals, and listen, they're there for everything that, that is unacceptable before God. Right. It's just amazing to me. I mean, they, they will lie about anything and everything, not the politicians do it. But again, they will, they will just, they'll lie about anything. They, they will, I saw something in it, I, I won't mention the politician's name, but they were, what he happened to have been saying, I mean, it was 150% wrong. I don't know who's telling him, but it, it was he was absolutely certain that what he was saying was right. And, and he repeated it two or three times to this news person that was that was asking questions. And, and I mean, again, two or three times. And I mean, you could you know what? He believes that the, the first time I heard him say it, I thought, oh, come on, you know, almost like, you know, better than that. But I mean, he said it again and he even stepped towards the guy. I mean, he's like, right here. He believes what he's saying. And he couldn't be more wrong. And, and everything proves he's wrong. Everything that's going on, all the poll numbers, all this kind of stuff, he's absolutely wrong. But he believes it. 
So I don't know who's feeding him the information, but they have him convinced of something that is not true. And uh, it's an amazing thing. When we get to that point in evil, we will. We'll believe anything. No matter what, the, when the proof is right in front of our eyes, we'll reject it. And we'll believe that which is not true. And so, oh, hand, uh, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. Of course, I always like this illustration. Uh, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Right. And it's not about the woman that I like. I always like the idea of some jewel or pearls before swine, you know, those kind of things. The pig doesn't know any different. Doesn't mean a thing to him. If you have, again, this jewel of gold in a swine's snout, does that stop him from rutting around? Why no? He's got it right down in the dirt, and he just keeps right on rutting around. He's right in the mud. He's, it means nothing at all to the pig. Just doesn't care. But then he goes on and he says, as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair, and the word fair there actually means beautiful, uh, if a fair woman or a beautiful woman, which is without discretion. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Um, at least some of you may have. Uh, you ever see a really pretty woman who's drunk? Well, I'll tell you, if that doesn't steal everything away from her looks, it doesn't matter how beautiful she may be. She's a drunk. And, and that's just not pretty. Uh, and, you know, so the idea here is, listen, if there a woman who has no discretion in the things she does, drinking, drugging, how she dresses, you know, the, the, all those kinds of things. Listen, that, that's all meaningless. When her, when her beauty is meaningless because of the way she acts, because of the way she dresses, because of the things she does, it steals away the beauty that, which, by the way, is God-given. It was God-given. And she has no discretion also goes on in verse 23, the desire of the righteous is only good, which we've been talking about a little, little bit before this. Listen, the desire of the righteous, that's only good. People who want to do right, they don't want to do wrong. It's just, it's not what they want. It's not their direction. It's not their thinking. And so the desire, what I desire to do, what I want is part of my life. The desire of the righteous is only good. I want good, not just for myself, my kids, my family, my grandkids, but everybody. I want good for my neighbors. I want, you know what? I want good for the people who are evil in that some good happening to them may get them thinking about their need for Jesus Christ. It's only good. And so the desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. Listen, that's who they are. It's how they live. And there can be no other expectation other than that. Why? Because they are living against God. And again, and there's other, other places here that, where it talks about, you know, what about these evil people and it seems like they have everything. And what does the Bible tell us? It's all going to come to an end. It's all going to come to an end. You know what? We've seen some of these people uh, growing older and older and older. And they're just wicked and they're vile and they never turn around. And, and all their needs are met many, many times way beyond their means or needs, excuse me. They have everything they want, plenty of money. And you sit back and say, I don't understand. How can God allow that? Oh, don't you worry. Time will come. Time will come. God's going to deal with it. It may not be, I may not get to see it. And I don't know that I want to. 
but God will have his way. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than is meat, or more than is fit, or more than they should, but it tendeth to poverty. And so what they're talking about here is someone who has, and maybe not a lot, but they see a need, and they give it, they scatter it. Okay, what they have, the, the money they have, the, the crops they have, you know, whatever they may have that somebody needs, and they see the need, they scatter it. And so there is that scatter it, and yet increase it. Well, it looks like they're giving everything away, but yet they still have plenty. You know what I mean? You know, go figure. How, how does this work? Uh, and, and yet, uh, it, it says here, that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that which withholdeth more than is meet, or fit, or that they should, but it tendeth to poverty. Boy, they may see a need, and there may be money, crops, whatever it is, coming into their possession. That's mine. That's mine. They're going to keep it all. More than is, is meat, as this says, or fit. Listen, they should look at what they have. What, look at, wow, look at what God's provided for me. Oh, hey, they need some help. Listen, here. But that's not the way they look at it. They look like, mine. You know, that, that's, hey, if they'd work a little harder, they'd be fine. You know, which sometimes has nothing to do with anything. Uh, problems can befall us all. And, and yet, uh, this matter, he who scattereth, he who is generous, and he who is more than willing to give of that which they have, and yet increaseth. But God gives the increase. God's the one who is going to see that they're taken care of. And then it says the liberal. And here the word liberal means generous. Okay? And so the liberal or the generous soul shall be made fat. And the idea here of fat is actually the word wealthy. And, and so the liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. When we are once again generous with all those things that we have, then we will be, as he uses the term watered, and of course this is written in what? An arid climate. Water is important. Water is life, physical life itself. And, and so if you're going to hoard something, you might want to hoard some water, okay? But no, no. He the water, he who is generous, he who does these things, or he'll be watered himself. God takes care of those things. <clears throat> he that withholdeth corn, and the word corn there means grain, uh, the people shall curse him, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. And again, some of these, I kind, of, okay, I kind of find this interesting. But he that withholdeth corn, the idea is you have your granaries and you have grain and you have more than enough, but you won't sell it. You'll hoard it. And, and so again, he that withholdeth, I'll use the word hoardeth, corn, the people will curse him because he won't sell. They're in need. And he has more than he needs. And he won't even sell it. So, yeah, they're not asking him to give it away. Because the, uh, at the end of the verse, it says, uh, again, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. Well, if you, if you got more than you need, why would you just continue to hang on to it? When there's others in need who are will, uh, obviously, according to this, they're willing to buy it. Again, not asking to give it away. They'll buy it. He won't even sell it to them. Again, just holds it over their head, if, if you will. It's a control. An absolute control issue. He that diligently seeketh good, he'll procure favor. But he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. And, and the idea here of procure, um, again, that's a, it's, it's obtaining. It's it's getting it's getting those things. You procure it. 
is so he that diligently seeketh good procureth favor. He gets favor. Whatever it was. God is rewarding with favor. But he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. Usually mischief, if you will, the idea is, is doing harm, uh, um, doing that simply which is wrong, in many cases doing that which is evil. And, and so someone who is involved in that, uh, he that seeketh mischief, it shall come what? Unto him. Ultimately, it falls right back on the person who is doing the evil. So often, again, we, we see that in people who are their thieves, their, you know, what other, whatever evil they're involved in, sooner or later, what happens? They get caught. Now, it used to be, and not very long ago, that they actually went to jail. We don't do that to criminals anymore. They need a 14th chance. You know, it's, it's, uh, a police officer that I know calls a catch and release. They catch them, they arrest them, they take them to jail, and the judge releases them immediately. Immediately. Then you hold them overnight. Just releases them. Then they go back out, they do it again. And they can have multiple warrants. Multiple. And a matter of fact, I just read today on, I don't remember which one of the news outlet. But it was some guy that just did some heinous crime. Well, he had multiple felony warrants on him. You know, do this, do that, okay? And it doesn't come. This is this, and this is the thing that troubles me. It's what's going on in this nation right now. They actually go before the judge, and and the judge, they they bond, they bond, bond, bond out. And say, okay, you have to return to court on such and such a day. They still come back. And they'll do it again and again and again. And the judge just keeps letting them go, letting them go, and letting them go. So now they have a, a, all of these you know, multiple bench warrants. Well, why don't you hang on to them one of those times? It wasn't because the police didn't arrest him and bring him in. Because the judge let him go and go and go. And, and so, again, when they are seeking mischief, it should come under them. Listen, they're, they're going to get away with it, and they're going to think it's great, and they're going to continue doing it. But there comes a time when God says, you know, right. or they do a crime so heinous thinking that once again, there's, hey, they've always gotten away with what? Everything before. And they think they'll get away with something that, that simply isn't going to be acceptable, period. Well, they finally run up against that that they can't get out of. And, and now they're right where they didn't think they'd ever be. You know, a criminal never thinks he's going to jail. And even if he goes to jail when he gets out, he never believes he's going to go back, no matter what he does. Goes right back out, gets right involved in crime again, and somehow thinks, this time I'm not going to get caught. I'm smarter this time. See, that's just mischievous thinking. I can get around this. I'm too smart for those guys. Um, but that doesn't work very well. Um, he that trusteth in his riches shall fall. But the righteous shall flourish as a branch. And again, just pretty plain. But he that trusts in his riches shall fall. If that's where my, and the idea here of trust is faith. I place my faith in my riches. They're going to fall. Maybe during their lifetime, but maybe after their lifetime is over. But they're going to fall. They're going to, you know, this is not, this isn't going to work for them. But the righteous shall flourish as a branch. And I like the way that they put that because it doesn't say he's going to flourish as a mighty oak, a whole tree, a tremendous. It just says, we'll flourish as a branch. Don't have to be the whole tree. Okay? Just, just a branch. And we shouldn't expect 
anymore than that. Listen, God is going to allow us to flourish. How as a branch? Listen, we're, we're out there, and, you know, a branch. Now, when I grew up with a lot of oak trees and acorns, and, and now I'll tell you what, every one of those branches on a good acorn year yielded lots of acorns. And for the deer and the other animals, they love acorns. And so they're being fed, they're being taken care of. From, yeah, all the things, what, that branch. And, and yet from the whole tree, yeah. But the branch is producing. Mm -hmm. And that's, it, listen, if, if I'm a branch that is producing for God, I should be a happy guy. Amen. Don't have to be the whole tree. Okay? Just the branch. Uh, he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. My, again, he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. You can inherit nothing. Okay, you can't even tell me you know, which which way the wind's going to blow day to day. You inherit the wind if it's where to come from, where to go, where it's coming again. You don't know. He inherits nothing, nothing that he can put his hands on. It's gone. Why does he do that? Because he troubled his own house, his own family. And again, the Word of God taught us about those things too. Uh, he that careth not for his own family is worse than an infidel. Listen, we're, we're expected to care for our own families. And the idea here is he that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. There's nothing. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls, wise. Once again, he uses the, the idea of the tree, the branch, now the tree. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. It's the fruit of the righteous. It's that which is produced by the righteous, which is the tree of life. Right. And of course, the tree of life is that picture of what in the Bible? Eternal life. Yeah. And then the uh, tree of life in the garden, uh, the idea of, of all those things, but it's the idea of eternal life. And so the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Well, why? Because in our righteous dealings, with other believers and with the world in general so that they can see, again, our witness through our lives. And they also should hear it from our lips. And that can, what? Change their life. They can come to, again, the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. What's, what's the whole book of Proverbs about? Wisdom, he that win his souls is wise. Behold, of course, pay attention whenever we run across that word. The righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Boy, the, the word recompensed uh, that we see here, uh, it has the idea of repaid, rewarded, and compensated. And so when we look at this, behold, the righteous shall be recompensed. We're going to be rewarded one day in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. They too are going to be recompensed. They too, as this tells us, are going to be repaid. They too are going to be rewarded for their deeds, for their wickedness, for those things that they have. What a huge difference. Again, in, in, this ver in this verse, using the same word, one for those who are, if you will, righteous before God, and the other, those who are evil before God, they're both going to be recompensed. They're going to receive, again, the reward of their deeds. Listen, wisdom in the book of Proverbs, just walking down through and Looking, okay, here's the righteous, here's the wicked. Here's the righteous, here's the wicked. In any possible circumstance of life, this is the way God sees it, this is the way God deals with it. And so just continuing to walk. Questions, comments, observations as we came down through those verses? That's a perfect analogy of John 15. 
Yeah, exactly. And and that goes right back to just saying, hey, I'm happy I'm a happy branch. Amen. Anything else? Ben. Yeah, amen. You know, there, there, here is an absolute definite need and not just of the prophet. And God, do what's right. She does what's right. Very potentially, at the cost of her own life and, 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 and her child. But she does what's right. God rewards her. And uh, yeah, a very good example of, of what we just read here. Others. Okay, let's go ahead then, and uh, we'll go ahead and take prayer requests tonight.